good evening. I see the numbers are mounting steadily as we start. So I'd like to welcome you to the British School and to tonight's online lecture. I'm Robert Code Stevens, Carey Fellow at the BSR, and tonight it's my great pleasure to present Maureen Carroll, who is Professor of Roman Archaeology at the University of York. Maureen is an old friend of the school and recently held our Senior Research Award as Hugh Last Fellow when she was looking at the role of women in votive religion, and she's already published on this in last year's PBSR, Marta Martuta, Fertility Cults and the Integration of Women in Religious Life in Italy in the 4th to the 1st century BC, 2019. Maureen is perhaps best known for her work on Roman funerary commemoration and what this reveals not only about the dead in antiquity, but especially about the living. She also has a distinguished record as a field archaeologist with long-standing projects in Pompeii and at the Roman imperial estate of Vagnari in Puglia. Among her many books are the classic work published by OUP in 2006, Spirits of the Dead, Roman Funerary Commemoration in Western Europe, and the groundbreaking volume she edited with E.J. Graham in 2014, Infant Health and Death in Roman Italy and Beyond. She also led the British team on a EU-funded project, Dress ID, on Roman textiles and clothing, which focused on dress and identity in funerary portraits on the northern frontiers. Tonight, we're to hear her talk on an intriguing mixture of these topics and more in a lecture which we're recording and will shortly be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So I'll now hand over to Maureen, uh, reminding you all that you can send questions which we'll discuss at the end of the lecture by using the Q and A button on your screen. So without further ado, let's welcome Maureen Carroll, who will speak on invisible foreigners in Imperial Rome, question mark, Masking Identities Through Cultural Dress Behaviour in Funerary Commemoration. Maureen. Well, thank you very much, Robert, for that kind introduction. And thank you and Harriet both for the invitation to uh, speak about my research at the BSR. Obviously, I'd much rather be there in person, uh, but that's simply not possible. And this lecture was actually scheduled for last year in person. Uh, to coincide with a publication of mine on this particular topic. So it's a bit late, the publication uh, appeared, the lecture didn't take place, but the lecture is taking place now. And uh, what I'm going to be talking about tonight are some aspects of that publication and also expanding on, on it in, in various ways. So I will put a reference up at the end of the PowerPoint in case anyone's interested in further pursuing that. So. Without further ado, then, uh, let's move on virtually to Rome. <clears throat> Is this on the screen and can you see it? Yes. OK, thank you. Right. Well, ancient Rome was a magnet for immigrants. That's putting it quite simply, but I think it's an accurate statement. As the capital city of a vast empire incorporating numerous populations with different ethnic origins, cultures and religions, it attracted many foreign newcomers, some arriving voluntarily, others involuntarily. These temporary and permanent residents of Rome ranged in status from slaves, teachers, soldiers and merchants to diplomats, princes, kings and queens. All of them will have spoken their own language at least when they first arrived, which would have made them stand out. And they will have been recognizable as others physically. This might be because the color of their skin. As Flora says about Chinese and Indian ambassadors in Augustan Rome, in the quote on the lower left, it is enough to look at their complexion to see that they were people who came from beneath another sky. The other in Rome could be distinguished by the color of their hair and their physiognomy, whether the, their hair was dark and curly or blonde, whether they wore long hair or short hair, uh, were mustachioed and so on and so forth. These would have allowed the other to uh, be recognized, but they were also recognized most certainly by the clothes they wore, especially if they dressed in garments typical of their home regions. Migrant identities have been studied on the basis of historical texts, 
inscriptions, language use, and religious communities. But in this paper, the foreign other in Rome is examined by looking at clothing and dress behavior. Dress is characteristically part of a social discourse and it plays an important role in self-presentation. A topic of an EU funded project called Dress ID on clothing and identity in which I had the pleasure to participate. In the Roman world, clothing contributed towards the definition of aspects of the wearer's identity, such as wealth, age, gender, ethnic affiliation, citizenship, or religious orientation, often all at one time and recognizable immediately. Those who dressed the same expressed a group identity, dress being very useful in reflecting a sense of community. Likewise, dress that was different from the norm highlighted the wearer as excluded from a group or perhaps the dominant power. It identified the other. On the Roman frontiers, whether they were Roman citizens or not, people frequently set up stone funerary monuments depicting themselves and members of their families in clothing that sent signals to others about their status and place within the local and wider community. And a good example of that are the Germanic Ubi, living uh, on the west bank of the Rhine with their capital city at Cologne. This could involve the adoption of Roman dress or the retention of one's own ethnic clothing, particularly for women who probably played a greater role in ensuring the continuity of traditional values, ideals and identities expressed through ethnic clothing and bodily adornment. So for example, on the screen in Cologne, we can see that Ubian women in particular and also their goddesses wore the same ethnic costume of a long, and long sleeved tunic with a cloak on top of that. And of course, most characteristically indicated by the very voluminous headdress. Note also that on some of these reliefs at any rate, the men are depicted as wearing Roman cultural dress. They're wearing the toga. So men much more frequently, frequently appear in these portraits in Roman clothing, appropriate to the social status and public roles in life. We can see this also in several funerary monuments of the Celtic Trevery on the Moselle River. For a pure, unadulterated early first century AD version of the Treveran female costume, we can look at the portrait of Menimana from Mainz on the upper right. And Menimana is wearing uh, an outfit that has three layers to it, uh, an undergarment, a long sleeve tunic on top of that, and then on top of that, a cloak that is pinned at the shoulders and at the chest with fibulae. And she's wearing an elaborate neck ring. Uh, she's also wearing a bonnet, not quite as voluminous as the Ubian ladies, but nevertheless, the bonnet is there. So the jewelry and the clothing and the headdresses signify ethnic belonging in this case. And this seems to have been the Treveran female dress in the early first century AD. But if we look at the funerary monument of Contuinda on the upper left, where we have men and women depicted, the garments of the men include the toga on the one hand, the citizen garment par excellence for Roman men, and the Greek hemation, perhaps alluding to a familiarity with Greek learning and philosophy. This Greco-Roman costume was unambiguous in its meaning in Roman society. And by choosing these garments, the males of the family are represented in idealized form as elite, classically educated Roman citizens, whether in fact they had Roman citizenship or not. Contuinda, on the other hand, wears the Treveran bonnet on her head. You'll have to take my word for this. A long sleeve tunic under another tunic held together with shoulder and breast fibulae over it, much like many mana. But She's wearing a Roman pala or cloak over that, like another contemporary statue pair from nearby Ingelheim at the bottom. And here we see the woman dressed in this mixture of Celtic and Roman clothing. But note that the man is dressed in a toga. These women are clothed in a way that indicates that they belonged to a generation still rooted in Celtic tradition that publicly was adopting at least some Roman cultural symbols and preserving their memory in a changing community. 
Obviously, we cannot know whether the ethnic dress we see in funerary portraits was worn on a daily basis, or if it represented special attire reserved for festivals, for particular social events and traditional celebrations. But particular garments and dress accessories are attributable to specific cultural and ethnic groups, and they would have been understood in antiquity as identity markers, especially in these frontier regions with their mixture of indigenous population and incoming Romans from Italy and various parts of the empire. But was this the case at Rome at well, as well? Given that many foreigners lived and died in Rome, should we not expect them to convey their ethnic origins in funerary texts and images? For communities of foreigners living in Rome far away from home, would it not be important in death to express origins, status and belonging in the same way as people, for example, on the Rhine or the Danube frontier did? And when foreign slaves were freed from servitude and suddenly possessed legal rights, would they not desire finally to have the liberty to embrace the heritage of their birthplace by showing themselves dressed in ethnic attire for posterity? This might after all have been their last chance to link themselves to their geographic and cultural origins. Roman literature suggests that foreigners and migrants literally flowed into the city of Rome. And here are three quotes on the screen uh, expressing much the same thing. Little is said by these writers about the pull factors for foreigners, although Seneca does say that people came to Rome on missions of public office, for education, for commercial reasons, for entertainment, to visit friends and as ambassadors. He did not differentiate between foreigners from regions within and beyond the empire or external visitors from country towns or colonies in Roman provinces nor does he mention anyone who might have ended up in Rome by force, such as slaves, who experienced the total rupture with their place of origin. Augustus, in his memoirs published in AD 14 at his death, lists royal embassies from India, Parthia, Media, Assyria, Britain, and Germany. And here are some of them listed on the screen. Defeated kings and the children of kings also appeared in Rome triumphs before Augustus, as he says. High status foreigners from the fringes of the empire and beyond, therefore, would have had a very public profile in Rome. And perhaps the more foreign and exotic they looked, the better for Augustus, who could visibly demonstrate his power over distant and foreign lands. Pompey the Great before him had also led defeated monarchs before the people of Rome in his triumph in 61 BC, and they included, and I quote, the son of Tigranes the Armenian, with his wife and daughter, Zosime, a wife of King Tigranes himself, Aristobulus, king of the Jews, a sister and five children of Mithridates from Pontus, Scythian women, and hostages given by the Iberians, by the Albanians and by the king of Comagene in Anatolia. Through historical sources, we know that some royal visitors resided in Rome for long periods of time. King Herod of Judea on the upper left visited Augustus in Rome and stayed for about three years from 40 to 37 BC. Tigranes III on the upper right on a coin of his uh, from Armenia spent 10 years from 30 to 20 BC under the protection of Augustus in Rome. And Juba II, a Berber prince and later king of Mauritania in North Africa, was brought by Julius Caesar to Rome where he lived for possibly 17 years until, until the early 20s BC. And I have a couple other examples here, uh, possibly a portrait of uh, Arminius of the Cheruski, uh, of a Germanic confederation and Dynamis, the Bosporan queen. They're all uh, cited as living in Rome for some time. And none of these individuals probably will have been in Rome without an entourage and staff from their kingdoms. And so it is likely that exotic and colorful foreign courts were striking features of life in the city. 
One of the largest entourages in Rome ever recorded was that of Tiridates, the first of Armenia in AD 63. He brought his sons, members of the Parthian and Armenian royal families, and 3,000 Parthian cavalrymen with him in his retinue. At the coronation of Tiridates in Rome in 66 AD, Nero himself in a very public ceremony placed the royal diadem on his head, as Suetonius says, elevating Tiridates to the role of crowned king of Armenia. Suetonius says that Nero took the turban from his head and replaced it with a diadem. Tiridates shows himself therefore in two different non-Roman headdresses, uh, both having been witnessed by great crowds of people in the capital. And Augustus' memoir revealed that the sons of Parthian royalty resided in Rome as well. Interestingly, Vonones I, here on a coin at the bottom, after 20 years as a hostage in Rome, was found too Roman for the Parthians when he returned as king. Note that unlike his um, grandfather at the top with long hair, he's um, wearing a short haircut. And Tacitus in his annals uses a, a similar phrase as Florus, whom I cited at the beginning in regard to Indians and the Chinese, that to the Parthians, Vonones, and I quote, had been sought from another world. In other words, returning to Parthia, but had been sought in a Roman world. But two of his brothers who died around the middle of the first century AD in Rome, never having returned to Parthia, or the family who buried them, clearly had not forgotten their royal status and the official Arsacid way in which that was expressed, as you can see in the inscription on the lower right. They are referred to in their Latin epitaphs of Parth as Parthians and sons of the king of kings. Foreign hostage children will have been a visible presence in Rome in, as well, both in reality and in art. Um, Augustus mentions uh, in his memoirs, but also uh, Suetonius in his uh, biography of Augustus mentions that foreign children were raised at court uh, with the children and grandchildren of Augustus. And the otherness of foreign children is clearly flagged up on the Arapacus here uh, which is executed in AD 9. Several Roman children on the reliefs on the altar are depicted in the procession scenes of the imperial family and officials on the altar reliefs as well. The boys with short cut hair and the toga, uh, the little girls wearing the toga and the tunic are clearly Roman children. But mingling with members of the imperial family are two little boys in non-Roman dress and they're on the screen here. The older long-haired child on the right, perhaps seven or eight years old, and wearing a diadem on his head, might be a Parthian prince. He wears the short tunic and rather elaborate boots, and he is connected with a woman wearing what may be the Parthian diadem. The youngest of the two boys on the left, a curly-haired toddler, wears a shorter tunic. His turquoise, or neck ring, alludes to a Gallic origin and a high status identity, suggesting that he may be the son of a Gallic chieftain. These elite foreign children express the worldwide range of the Augustan peace and the recognition of Roman authority amongst subject, client and foreign peoples. That so much detail is focused on the clothing of Roman and foreign children in the procession is a clear indication that it mattered very much what one wore and that it was noticed and understood as part of the language of clothing and identity. But the ideal of raising foreign children, future client kings in Rome in order that they might be better rulers in their homelands later did not hold up in reality. Various sons and grandsons from Eastern and Western kingdoms on returning after many years in Rome as an alumnus urbis were rejected by their people as, and I quote Tacitus here, infected by foreign nurture, servitude, and dress. This again underscores the importance of clothing as an expression of cultural belonging or alliance, both for Romans and for other peoples. 
In addition to the historical accounts and public art referring to external visitors to Rome, funerary monuments are a rich source of information on the origins of immigrants and foreigners in the city. A limitation being that not everyone had an inscribed gravestone and that some groups, such as soldiers, were more likely to be commemorated than others for financial or cultural reasons. Despite the unevenness of the epigraphic record, David Noy was able to recognize broadly prevalent geographic regions represented in the city. These included Gaul and Spain, Central and Eastern Europe, Greece, Asia Minor, Syria, Egypt, Judea and North Africa. In his book, Foreigners at Rome, he explored foreigners living in Rome by the ways in which they used language, uh, a tool such as language, um, or the way they referred to their region of origin and to the names that are preserved as reflective of a separate identity. There is no consideration of dress or clothing as one of these tools. Roman authors did not always respond positively to the presence of foreigners in the capital city, and there were deep-seated attitudes towards some outsiders such as the Greeks, ranging from ambivalence to outright hostility. Juvenal in the late first and early second century AD raged against the presence of so many Greeks and Syrians who brought strange languages and exotic music with them. Although there is nothing exotic about Claudius uh, Agathemeros and his wife Myrtale, on the monument on the lower right. It is apparent that the comments about foreigners in Rome usually relate to language and to customs, uh, but there are also direct and indirect references to foreign dress in Roman sources. Those things which Virgil cited as making defeated barbarians appear noticeably different were not only language and arms, but also appearance and costume. People on the streets of Rome saw triumphal processions of prisoners of war from far-flung regions parading past them, probably quite often. They would have seen firsthand many foreigners arriving in this way and witnessed the physical appearance of the other. But we must keep in mind that these so-called barbarians are depicted in their uh, national dress and in the particular stance of prisoners, because they're depicted by the Romans. This is the Roman narrative. This is almost certainly not how they would depict themselves in their funerary commemoration. And we've seen examples of that from the Rhineland at the beginning. Uh, people who a generation or two earlier would have been considered by the Romans as barbarians. Classic depictions of the barbarian other at war and in defeat appear in state art in the imperial capital and elsewhere. In these examples on the screen, you can see barbarian men, women and children, Dacians, Parthians and others uh, who are depicted in their indigenous dress and they stand out immediately uh, from the Roman participants, be it the long trousers, be it the long sleeve tunics, um, the headdresses, the clothing, the jewellery, all of them are immediately recognisable as something of the other. The physical appearance and dress of foreigners could be judged negatively, especially if the garments were thought to signal moral laxity on the part of the wearer. Persian wealth and perceived Eastern decadence are flagged up in Petronius' Satyricon in the first century AD. And he says, by adopting Persian ways, a synonym for luxury and decadence, Roman boys would become themselves decadent. Juvenal disparages the trousers worn by Armenians in Rome as effeminate. Although Armenians staying long enough in Rome might discard them, having become more Roman, and return home to Artaxata with Roman customs. And this is relevant to my earlier discussion on hostages and client kings residing in Rome. Whereas trousers in the East were deemed effeminate, trousers in the West were considered a symbol of the barbaric, as in the case of the Gauls. In fact, Julius Caesar was criticized in the mid first century BC for granting citizenship to the elites of Southern Gaul. As Suetonius says, and I quote, Caesar led the Gauls in triumph and likewise into the Senate House. 
the Gauls took off their trousers and put on the wide stripe. End of quote. Meaning the Gauls exchanged their traditional ethnic dress for the striped toga of the Roman senator. The reaction to non-Roman dress is surely a manifestation of the perceived threat to the fabric of Roman society and culture by the other. Augustus must have felt this acutely when he saw Romans in the city dressed in what he considered inappropriate attire, as he endeavored uh, to restore the old habit and dress of the Romans. And he gave orders to the Aediles not to permit in future any Romans uh, to be present in the forum or circus unless they took off their short coats and wore the toga. This is a quote from Suetonius at the top. This cultural form of public dress worn by Roman citizen men who fulfilled civic roles was Roman. Not to wear the toga as a Roman was un-Roman. This garment was reserved, as Suetonius elsewhere says, for Rome's conquering sons lords of the widespread globe. An interesting episode or perhaps two episodes that have been conflated in Rome during the reign of Claudius and of Nero, you can see them in the two quotes below uh, Suetonius, records the visit of Parthian and Armenian envoys in the theater of Pompey, where they sat according to their rank and as a special compliment to the nations with members of the Roman Senate. So the best seats in the house for the Senate, but also for these ambassadors. German ambassadors in the audience, however, noticed the Parthian and Armenian envoys who clearly stood out, surely by their dress. The second story recalls two Frisian kings from north of the Rhine in Rome around AD 58. So just beyond the frontier actually. And they're also at the theater. Um, and when the Frisians were led into the theater by their Roman guides, they noticed a few men in foreign dress in the senatorial seats and inquired who they were. So clearly even Germanic ambassadors and kings from the north noticed that there were people in the theater who did not look Roman and whose dress marked them out as the other. How much more obvious must this have been to those born and raised in Rome? Funerary monuments were erected by people to express status and ensure remembrance. And as such, they offer a special insight into the perception and representation of self and the visual showcasing of various aspects of identities. Many freeborn people on the frontiers and in the provinces made the choice to be remembered in the clothing peculiar to their ethnic group and region, as we have seen at the beginning indicating that a visual portrayal of ethnic identity was an important factor in conveying one's self-perception and sense of identity. There are literally hundreds of these funerary monuments on the northern frontiers. But what about Rome? Well, any attempt to explore the depiction of foreign people in ethnic dress in their funerary commemoration in the city of Rome encounters obstacles. Instead of being able to choose from a wide range of such depictions as one might expect in a city with so many foreigners, both freeborn and freed, we are hindered by the scarcity of this type of evidence. Freeborn Roman civilian citizens, should they choose to portray themselves in funerary reliefs, might opt to show themselves dressed as Romans, but images of them are even rare. Even honorific statues of elite Roman men and women in Rome appear not to have been very common in the first century BC and became even rarer in the early imperial period. There were hundreds of thousands of slaves from all over the empire who were brought to and died in Rome. If slaves were lucky, they might be given a decent burial and a space within a group monument built either by the owner of the household or by the slaves themselves who formed a modest burial club through membership fees. In the epitaphs marking the burial niches of cremation urns of such individuals in Rome, names were stated and perhaps the slaves role within the household, but little else about their geographic or ethnic origin is ever revealed. When they were freed, ex-slaves assumed the family name of the former owner because they had lost their birth names, their family connections, and any legal rights when they were enslaved. 
Sometimes the names of freedmen, liberti, suggest a particular origin outside Rome, and indeed outside Italy, although the popularity of Greek names for slaves cannot be taken necessarily as proof, proof of a Hellenic ethnic origin. This epitaph of three individuals buried on the Via Appia records Jewish cognomina, all former slaves of a Lucius Valerius. We can recognize their Jewish identity in death through the recorded nomenclature, but in life, their physical appearance, language and religion might have revealed more uh, immediately that they were Jewish immigrants before and perhaps even after manumission. The retention of non-Roman practices might be more likely if ethnic groups lived in neighborhoods in Rome where they formed relatively close communities, something like migrant quarters. The tendency of immigrant groups to cluster in specific areas of a city is familiar in modern migration, partly because people choose to live among others of a similar background or among people with a shared language and cultural connection. The preservation of separate identities at local level might be facilitated in this way. Lawrence Tacoma in his book, Moving Romans, has demonstrated, however, that these did not exist in the capital of Rome. Although, of course, there may have been a community of Jewish freedmen in Trastevere. Perhaps the diverse nature of immigration prevented the development of stronger forms of residential segregation. The fact that a significant part of the migration consisted of forced mobility of slaves who ended up anywhere in the city will not have helped either. Tacoma concluded that it is highly questionable that cultural diversity was cherished by immigrants in Rome or that immigrants felt a need to express a migrant identity in the city. This might be a modern notion of a multicultural society that differs crucially from ancient attitudes. Although it happens only rarely, former slaves might record their place of origin, as in the case with a group listed on this epitaph of the mid first century BC from Rome. Thus, we have a Tibetan, sorry, not a Tibetan, a Theban uh, from northern Greece, a Phrygian from central Anatolia, a Smyrnan from western Anatolia, and a Carthaginian from North Africa, named as companions in death here. People from such disparate places in the Roman Empire could really only end up together in Rome because the slave system had brought them together. And they were buried together because they had no birth families living or they had no longer any contacts with them after so many years in captivity. Instead, they created a family of their own, a family of liberty, most of them having been the property in this case of the Numitori family. Uh, and unrelated by blood. Relationships such as these were formed across boundaries. A special feature of funerary practice in Rome in the first centuries BC and AD are the group or family tunes set up by freedmen and freedwomen. And here are some examples on the screen. These tombs are numerous, reflecting the large numbers of freedmen in the urban population of Rome. Beginning in the second quarter of the first century BC, they were adorned, uh, they adorned the outer facade of a tomb. Uh, they're made usually of marble and they have multiple portraits on them, usually portrait busts, uh, and they depict the numerous uh, members of the burial community within. Their faces, often unflinchingly portrayed warts and all, ultimately are based on and carved in emulation of the so-called veristic or very um, not realistic portraits of the Roman aristocracy. And we can see some of those at the top in the top row, these aristocratic, very stern warts and all faces. The aristocrats, of course, were celebrating their noble ancestry. And they did that with galleries of wax masks of preceding generations. Aristocratic values are expressed by clothing and by this unflinching depiction of age and the uh, gravitas that these portraits uh, reveal. 
So some of the aristocratic values include ability to reason, logic, wisdom, authority, seriousness, no one ever smiles in a Roman funerary portrait, dignity, modesty, purity and chastity, the latter two particularly important, of course, for women. Now, these same features, of course, are expressed uh, by using some of the same mechanisms, the rather serious sober facial expressions, as you can see on in the bottom selection of portraits, and the clear uh, age indication and uh, mat maturity expressed in the portraits. These are uh, signals adopted by freedmen and freedwomen too. In fact, the, the uh, freedman couple at the lower left is a good example of this. Um, these are the portraits of Gratidia Carite. She is a freedwoman and Marcus Gratidius Libanus, uh, probably an ex-slave with a Greek cognomen. Now, the inscriptions are no longer present on the portrait busts. They were recorded in the late 16th century and then sawn off. And so after the 16th century, the portraits were looked at and thought to be the old aristocrat Cato, always very serious and somewhat sour, and his wife Porcia, because it was thought that they represented visually solid, upstanding Romans of sterling character. And in fact, what they represent is the freedman class trying to emulate the aristocracy in some regard. And this pertains also to the portrait of Gaius Julius Helius on the lower left, who is a freedman who was a simple, if not somewhat wealthy, um, shoemaker. These virtues were also signaled through dress and bodily adornment, as well as pose and general appearance. Important garments are the toga for men and for women, the uh, modest body covering layers of tunic and stola, uh, which is, is a bit like a pinafore covering the tunic and keeping away prying eyes. And then on top of that, the pala, yet another mantle. So these garments, the toga, the stola and the pala are precisely what is flagged up in the funerary portsmen of freedwomen, freedwomen and freedmen. And I have two of them here, which I've marked with a red star. But freedmen were not simply copying the nobility for they could never hope to achieve the status of the freeborn upper classes and certainly not by trying to look like them. However, being able to commission portraits of themselves gave the freedman class the opportunity to express many facets of their identity. And it is interesting to see what aspects of their personhood and identity they strove to highlight. The adoption of the moral virtues of the elite in society and the display of newly gained status are actively highlighted in these portraits, a selection of three of them here. Despite the fact that so many freedmen and freedwomen probably came from distant frontier regions and newly conquered zones on the fringes of the Roman Empire, not a single individual in these portraits uh, conveys through their clothing and habitus that they were anything but solid Roman citizens born and bred in the center of the empire. These people were not simply interested in fitting in. On becoming a slave, one's ties to blood relatives and home communities were brutally interrupted. On manumission, former slaves were claiming a place for themselves in the social hierarchy and compensating for years of servitude and invisibility in slave owning households and in the eyes of the law as well. Even after they were freed, Freedmen and freedwomen carried the stigma of their former status with them and did not have all avenues of social advancement open to them. But they did have two significant new advantages. One was that they possessed Roman citizenship when freed. With citizenship in their possession, these, Roman, these former slaves chose to look like citizens. There is a certain communal Roman look. This has been remarked on many times uh, to the portraiture of the freedman class. They clothed themselves in the dress of the Roman citizen man, the toga, or the attire of the Roman matron, the pala, to which of course they were entitled with their new status. This is the habitus of the Roman citizen. Both garments being voluminous and unpinned cloaks also alluded to elevated status 
as they could not be worn if one were engaged in manual or physical labour. They're just simply too cumbersome. The faces of these portraits are individualised, suggesting that the images aspired to be real likenesses, but there is nothing individual in their dress and certainly no hint of the other, nothing foreign. The people in the portraits all wear the same culturally coded garments, whether they might have been from Greece, from Syria, Africa, Gaul or Spain. The second new advantage manumission brought to this class of people, of course, was the right to legally marry and bear legitimate freeborn children with Roman citizenship, which is why we see children often highlighted in the portraits, dressed as Roman citizens in a little Roman toga and wearing the bulla, the locket around uh, on a chain around one's neck. Now here, just to diverge very briefly, I wanted to flag up a votive altar to the gods of Palmyra in Syria, dedicated in Rome by Tiberius Claudius Felix and his wife Claudia Halpis, likely of freedman status, and their son Tiberius Claudius Alipus. Members of the Palmyrene community in Rome continued to worship the gods of their homeland, using the votive altar, a Roman cultural vehicle, to do so. In Latin and in Aramaic, you can see both languages inscribed on this altar. Um, this is from the Janiculum Hill in Rome. It has been pointed out often that traditionalism prevails in regard to the choice of language and iconography on these Palmyrene religious dedications. But in keeping with the theme of this lecture, would traditionalism also have manifested itself in the choice of clothing made by Palmyrenes living in Rome? If they had died in Rome and were commemorated there, would they have chosen to depict themselves in their ethnic clothing? As here illustrated at the bottom in a Palmyrene funerary portrait and in the paintings from the Temple of the Palmyrene Gods at Dura Europus, or would they have looked like any other freedman couple in Roman cultural dress? I think the latter is more likely the case. Freedmen and freedwomen were once outsiders when they were brought to Rome from their homelands. The ethnic origin or natio of slaves was something that had to be declared when they were auctioned. So a slave owner would have been aware of the ethnic and regional origin of his property. The highlighting of different racial origins might also be an element of Roman funerary reliefs, such as this one, possibly from Rome, now in Geneva, showing an African slave wearing what appears to be a turban or wrapped headdress, serving her Roman mistress and reflecting her owner's wealth and access to costly and exotic possessions. One wonders how this slave woman, had she depicted herself after manumission in death, uh, would have looked, probably like any other Roman. So once a slave was freed and we witness him or her recorded in death, no clue is conveyed about the heritage or the otherness of that person. David Noy concluded on the epigraphic evidence for foreigners in Rome that, and I quote him, those who preferred to blend into the Roman background are now largely invisible in the sources, end of quote. This blending into the background pertain, pertains also to dress behavior. There are many invisible foreigners in Rome because they chose Roman dress for their funerary portraits. Whether they might have worn the ethnic dress of their region at home or in private or on the streets of Rome in public, we do not know. But for posterity, they dressed like Romans. It is ironic that although it was the Roman slave system that had negated the ethnic origin, cultural heritage, and family links of foreign slaves. It was the slaves themselves, when manumitted, who continued to render all those things invisible by adopting Roman dress behavior in their own commemoration. They chose to follow the Roman cultural, civic, and moral model in attire and habitus, probably because there was uh, no social advantage at all for them to being foreign or representing alterity in the empire's capital. And they had everything to gain by embedding themselves into mainstream Roman society. 
If foreigners in Rome felt no instinctive need to express a migrant identity, they may well have chosen to conform and adopt the dominant cultural identity of their new home community. And if foreign birth might have been associated with a servile past, ethnic origins might be judiciously left out of an epitaph too. The Roman toga and the Roman pala became a kind of disguise, if you like, in freedman funerary art. Masking the ethnic origins of the individual and rendering that part of one's identity invisible. That is not to say that freedmen necessarily were covering up their past. Uh, rather, through their portraits in family groups, they were opening up uh, a future, in my opinion. Such people, to paraphrase Greg Wolf, joined the insiders' debate about what being or becoming Roman was at particular times. Although elite veristic portraiture of the first centuries BC and AD in Rome was a celebration of noble families and generations of elite ancestors in the past, Friedman portraits advertised newly acquired freed status, inclusion in the Roman citizen body and the creation of family history from that moment in time. The dress of people in these portrait reliefs show them to have adopted traditional male and female values. This dress is timeless, underscoring their assimilation, at least on the surface, of Roman values and customs. Rome was one of the cultural places, perhaps the most crucial place of all, where Roman identity was defined. What counted in Rome in this circumstance was Romanitas and dressing and looking Roman in a conservative and conventional guise was an effective way to communicate not only this, but also to indicate who one wanted to be. Thank you very much for your attention.